Okay, so hello, good afternoon again, and uh, welcome to the second edition of the Alprost, an open discussion about uh, the SUSE adaptable Linux uh, platform. The same as uh, last year, feel free to ask anything uh, about uh, the product or anything around uh, the adaptable Linux platform. Just uh, keep in mind that uh, we may not be able to respond to everything uh, you ask. Uh, there are many things which are still under discussion. Any discussion or any decision which uh, is taken can, if there are new circumstances, be revisited at a later point of time. If uh, for whatever reason we will not be able uh, to respond, uh, you will find uh, my email address on the slide, uh, so uh, feel free to send me an email next week, next month, uh, whenever it works for you, and uh, I will do my best to either answer directly or find the right person who can uh, give you the answer. And uh, before uh, we uh, actually open for uh, the questions. Uh, I would like uh, to introduce ourselves, uh, or every of, the, of my colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is uh, Jiří Schrein. Uh, I'm here in the role of uh, the architect uh, for uh, Suze Alp, and I believe my colleagues can introduce themselves. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Alexander Herzig. I'm an Alp release manager for the next few days and then I will hand over to Yezi or some others proceeding with Alp. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, Marco Varlese, uh, director of the systems engineering department in SUSE. Uh, my department looks after SLE, uh, SLE code base slash SLED. BCI, WSL offering, and these days working on ALP. Good afternoon. Stefan Bielert. I'm one of the product manager in the enterprise Linux department of SUSE. And one of my products or platforms I'm responsible for is ALP. So, we are Ready to yeah. take your so, question. Thank you for the introduction. So if anybody, anybody wants to ask a question, please try to grab the microphone so that uh, others as well as us uh, can uh, hear you well and uh, we will do our best to give uh, you the answers. Maybe raise your hand so that you are visible. And yeah. Does anyone have any questions? To start off, we know it's going to... Oh, here we go. So, um, as an example, if uh, on my system I have 10 different containers with custom config inside, how uh, can I update them? Because uh, normally I would have to update each one separately, right? And I cannot also use... Uh, uh, update the container itself because then my custom config would be gone. So is there any update management system in planning that could update all containers or could look into this and update it? Short uh, answer at this point of time, no. Anyway, I'm not entirely sure I understand uh, your problem. Uh, if I got it right, uh, you want to update the container but keep uh, some part of it, meaning the configuration or some data, right? Yes, exactly. Then, yeah. I, then I believe that the best you could do is really to keep this configuration data outside the container and uh, map uh, a directory from the host system into the container so that if even then then even if you download uh, the container, the newer version of the container from the registry, you can uh, the configuration or all the data which is living outside uh, the container stays untouched. Okay, thanks. Now, 
not, not a question, just uh, I wanted to add to your question as an answer. Uh, me. Hi. <laughs> uh, you, you see it sometimes in tutorials when you, for example, spin up, a, I don't know, MariaDB server or something, you're supposed to uh, have a volume, which is the minus V option, and then keep your database in a different folder. So you can always delete the container and always run it, create it newly just from a different image version. And that's how it's, in quote unquote, supposed to work. That, that, that was the intention, but I mean, you can do whatever you want, of course. That's, you, you, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. I don't have a question. <laughs> Other questions? Any raised hands? Uh, okay. Thanks. I don't know whether this is the right forum to ask, but what does ALP mean for the future of Leap? <laughs> Has this changed since last year? And in what respect? Um, what do you mean with the future? Will there be an open SUSE distribution? Yeah. For sure. No, I mean, I, um, what I took from last year was that the next leap will be based on ALP. And um, is this still true? Is this still the timeline that? Um, 15.5 is the last one. Is this still true? Um, uh, I have a little bit the impression that also mm. the timeline of ALP was not fixed last year and probably changed. Though this might also um, introduce changes to the timelines of um, LEAP and the future development of LEAP. Let me answer this in a personal way, not as product manager. I would find it good if there's a 15.6 on the leap side, because that would make sense from my personal experience. But I know that Lubosch has a session, I think on Sunday, don't nail me down, where he wants to bring up proposals how to handle the future there of leap. So I don't know personally. I would like one thing, but overall I think it's also a good idea to think about of having maybe a SLE and an ALP based version, because not everybody will be wanting to switch fast. You want a little bit of transition phase, you want a little bit of time to get familiar with what you have. How it's best done, yeah, we are all a little bit in an unworked territory in that regard. But Lubosch, I know, has some proposals, and I don't want to speak for Lubosch here. Sorry? So I wait for the Sunday. Yeah, I think it's Sunday. Please check the <laughs> schedule. If, if I may add uh, some notes. Uh, right now, Leap is uh, built uh, based on Sleep 15 service packs. Uh, Stefan, how many service packs are we still going to deliver? We have communicated until SP7 for 15, so there would be still some time where you exactly. can have a leap based on 15, if you want that. Exactly. It's uh, on uh, the open source community whether there is really interest in uh, building multiple or f further open source leap releases based on uh, SLEE 15 code base or uh, when, whether and when uh, to switch uh, towards uh, the ALP platform. So Lubash's talk is tomorrow at uh, 1300. In this okay, it's tomorrow. <coughs> so tomorrow is Sunday, officially. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like um, COVID again. Um, anyway. Um, Two questions that I have is on one end, how do, uh, from the ALP perspective, how does the user experience looks like? Um, 
and how does the developer experience look like? How, how, how do you envision me developing a, either an application made in Rust? How do I, how, uh, what is going to be the, the, the recommended way to take my application and deploy it? Is it going to be only containers? Is it go, are you going to allow me packaging RPMs and, publish, um, and putting them into the image? Let me try. Let me try to answer. From uh, and I'm, I know that I will not be as specific as you would like, but for the user's perspective, in the ideal result, users should not really notice and find make any difference whether. Uh, their workload is uh, running uh, directly on the host or in a container. We should, uh, or we intend to really hide it as much as possible. It should be a matter of uh, enabling the service. The service downloads the container from the registry, optionally at least, and uh, runs it in a container. From uh, the developer perspective, uh, we for the product will still build everything, every container from RPMs, which means that uh, the RPMs will also uh, be available for uh, the developers so that you can build uh, your application against uh, our RPM package libraries and then uh, put them into the container or uh, if reasonable, ship the RPM for bare metal installation. There is uh, one thing which uh, will be notable, and that is uh, the transactional system, which uh, not 100% anymore, but a uh, few weeks back still meant that if you installed additional RPM, the only way to get use, to start using it was uh, a reboot. Uh, now, uh, transitional update has the instant apply option. So, as a follow-up, uh, then on the side of the user, does it mean uh, if we're saying that it's going to be transparent, uh, the user at some point is going to install the applications in which way? So that's one question, and then? Well, clearly you will not install them via zipper. You will need to install them via Podman, pull them from the registry, but uh, then starting uh, a service should be close to the same. Okay. Um, and let me add to that. I hope in the long term it doesn't matter if it's a container, an RPM, or anything else, but you have one tool for installation. Will this work from the beginning? Uh, careful look at the engineering side, I guess not. But that's what the long term, of course, is. And help is always appreciated. I mean, let's be honest, as a user, I don't care what package format is used. I care that the application, the tool does what I need to do. Mm -hmm that I can easily handle it, install it, update it, be secure. And if this is now as yes, container, flatback, snap, TOF, pile, binary, whatever else there is, I don't want to care about that. I want to be able to verify that this is still what I installed, mm -hmm. that this is what I got from the source, that it's proven. But what it is, I don't want to care. And that means for me that I want to have one tool to do it and not have to think about it. Will this work from the beginning? For sure not. But on the long term, hopefully transparent. My vision here still is to have at one point just say install that, however the command is called, and it's done. That's exactly what I meant with user experience. because. Honestly speaking, I also don't care if, if it's a tarball that I'm downloading from IP, uh, IP over pigeon. Yeah. Let's be clear. ALP is a long run that we do here. Mm -hmm. We have a big vision for that. We want to change a lot of things. 
that is not done in a day or two, maybe not even in a week or a month. But we think you need a vision where you want to go. And you need to start with the first step. And that step has been begun. We are sometimes not quite sure if we are on the straight way to the goal or if we have taken a little bit of a detour. But in the end, the mountain peak to stay in the picture of the Alps is still in our vision and look, we look at it. So we are also happy for every question and every help we get. And it's something we want to do together with the community. That's why we want also a developer experience there. That was your first question also. Do we have all things set now so that it works flawlessly and easy? Well, not necessarily. Those who were here with Dominic's call um, presentation earlier, it was a little bit of hard to get things into AWS, mm -hmm. but it works. And that's where we want to improve and get better. And maybe Dominic helps us a little bit to make it smoother. Um, I just wanted to add something because I, I think your question is very concrete and I want to be a little bit less abstract. So the transparency of the workload that you're talking about from an end user perspective has been our thought from day zero. And there is ongoing research and experimentations in that area, whether being containers to be less seen as containers and more like just standard workloads or workloads that run on bare metal and you again don't have to know what they are or how they run. Um, the, the prototyping of it is still not really ready for a consumption, right? It's really more like icky things pulled together in, in the lab, uh, but it's ongoing. Right? And this is the end user uh, experience that you're talking about. From a developer experience, one thing that we have, I think, communicated multiple times is the different streams, the different life cycles that we want to achieve through ALP, which was not possible before. And, and here is the, the famous words that I cannot really pronounce, which is <laughs> com compartmentalization or something like that, right? Um, which will it's, it's a crazy word, right? But I mean, it's different from contain containers. And this already tells you that it's not necessarily using containers only what we want to achieve, right? Because if I imagine myself developing in whatever other language, I would like to have all the versions at my disposal, playing with them, migrating easily from one round to the other, maybe running my testing pipeline locally, and so on and so on and so on and so on, with one platform, right? And this is what we want to get to. And this is the different life cycles and the different streams that we are implementing. That separation is not necessarily done with containers. And now I finally understand the hard question of those where everybody here needs to say 10 times compartmentalization, right? <laughs> and everybody who laughs will have the same experience. We will test you. You may have noticed I had it on one slide, one of the slides before, and didn't say the word. <clears throat> uh, you have another question? Because Lubos is kindly coming uh, to answer a question, no? I just have a follow-up no. to the developer. Go, f go first, yeah. Go for so, um, I really appreciate the transparency on the um, user, uh, from the user, uh, user point. And this is more or less where I was already kind of thinking. You just kind of confirm uh, that sense. Now, on the developer experience, uh, how do you envision how the tool chain is going to look like? Are, uh, because I'm hearing different uh, arguments uh, or different proposals, and I still don't know how that's going to look like. So a little bit of that transparency there will help. I think that you gave the answer yourself. There are different opinions mm -hmm. and different ways. We have to find out what's the best way of doing it. Um, I'm looking carefully here at the developers because 
as you heard, I'm not necessarily. We will make mistakes, of course, on the way. That's clear. That's good why we have several proposals. We are looking into how to make it work best. That's the fairest answer we can give currently, unless one of you wants. Again, that really is part of that isolation that I was mentioning before. And all the different conceptual uh, ideas that we are experimenting with, they can have different implications. And this is the reason why there are few options on the table, but none of it is still very much nailed down yet. In your ideal world, how it would look like? <laughs> what it would look like in an ideal world? In the ideal world, it looks easy and perfect for everybody. Un unfortunately, everybody is different. So, be with us. You won't get a clear answer on that. Besides that, we try. I saw. I saw a hand. Yeah, I was. Uh, asked, um, I wanted to know whether you had an idea on how to handle with air gap installations. So, you know, running your ARP system without internet action uh, connectivity to a registry. What happens? So, air gapped is nothing new, let's be very clear. Um, we have in the requirements for the whole our platform that built in. The same problem appears with RPM or with every package format you have. And yes, one of the requirements that has been put out is to solve also the air gapped scenarios in a better way than we currently do with RPMs also for containers. That means you will have some kind of proxy, and I'm paraphrasing this, that you now have for an RPM, also for a container. In the end, you can, always, you can only bridge an air gap scenario by either moving a USB stick, a hard drive, whatever, or by having a proxy, if you have an, how to say, virtual air gap scenario. So, it will be a proxy that exists also for containers and RPMs. Nothing dramatically different from the RPM world. And, and of uh, course, it should be transparent if it's a container or an RPM on the proxy, so you only need one. <clears throat> and actually, speaking of the initial deployment, uh, we are looking into ways uh, how to include uh, the container or the kind of pre-deployed on the, on the images, uh, which uh, you will reach with the USB stick, so you don't need several of them. So today, if I have a Linux server or a some machine, it's quite easy for me to retrieve all the software versions that I run at the moment and all the different licenses. And that's because we have just a single source of that information, which is the RPM database. Um, how would I be able to handle that in, uh, in a similar way so that I know about all the stuff I, that I run or that is even installed, which might be even overwritten in a layer? and that I'm probably not allowed to have in my system. And I want to know about this. I don't see that this is so easy at the moment. So one thing that we were actually showcasing with the March prototype is the adoption of the Neo Vector stack. I want to scan. I I really want to be able to scan, not just to see what happens in my network or something like that, but I want to know this software is installed on my server in that version with those licenses. And if something is maybe in a container overwritten in a different layer, which is not allowed in my system, for example, I want to know that because I have to remove it. And it's not about having something in the network and scanning there and forbidding something. It's about knowing what's there. No, that's not the only thing that NeoVector does. That's what, what I was going to. Uh, you can also tell which container is allowed to do what. And we could basically provide profiles within a given container that 
is only allowed to do that, that stuff. So you will know if something is running that is not meant to be running because that system would flag it to you. So if I have a software project that changes license and the older license is, for example, not allowed to me, this still would be installed, which is not compliant. This is something that no vector will never know and which actually doesn't care about, rightly. But I still need to know. I'm not 100% sure I understand what you're targeting at, because there are several aspects to your question. First of all, as an admin, I of course want to know what's running, and I want to prohibit things to run that are endangering my systems, that are manipulating my system, that might be a security risk, or in other ways not doing what I intend them to do. That's for sure. That's a problem that's as old as the binary formats. So as long as you can install a binary on a system, you will have that problem. On the alt platforms, you can mitigate that to some degree with the SE Linux that we have in the enforcing mode, which covers a lot of things on the first side. But that would be the easy answer. And I'm pretty sure you're not looking for an easy answer. The other thing that you definitely want to know is what is running on containers. So if I have 50 containers running of A or 50 containers of B running on a machine, or if container A, B and C are running, yes, that needs some monitoring tool, for sure. That needs to be there. The other part that you described, and I'm not sure if I got that scenario complete, is that the container changes the license. Was this the question? My question is if I am compliant, I have to be compliant. If I have a license and I'm not allowed to have, it's totally irrelevant. Yes, okay, thanks. Let me ask you a daring question. How do you do it with RPM currently? You check the RPM, right? So a container will have an S-bomb, a software bill of materials, that gives you exactly the same information. And we need just to ensure that that software bill of materials is really um, the right word would be connectable to the container. Does this give you the security that you want and the confidence as good as RPM, as long as both are signed and signed with the key of a vendor you trust? Yes. If you get your container out of some third party repository, registry, whatever, honestly, you're in the same situation like getting an RPM if you trust it install it, if you take a binary from some different source and put it into your root file system, you're on your own in that regard. And I see no way of preventing that without locking the system down in a way that makes it unusable. With SE Linux, you can do some part of it, no. but not all. And that is always the uncertainty you will have to live with. So what you actually tell me now, and which is quite important to me, is that uh, when I get some software solution, some container from you, I will always get a full software bill of material. And if I want, if I get it from somewhere else, which I obviously can run there as well, I will have to ask the other uh, vendor. That's the plan, yes. I mean, look at what we did with 15. We have there, meanwhile, also a software bill of material for all of the service packs and everything else. So you can download that, use it, and check what's inside. And we are not planning to have less on the ALP side. Of course, you won't find that now with the prototypes at the moment, because that is neither supported nor in a final state at the moment. But we are getting closer. OK. Yeah, I would like to come back to the point um, from the 
presentation earlier that development is now moved from OBS to IBS um, and that no new packages for now will be released on OBS. Um, but what if I would like to build for the next prototype release, again, an AMI for AWS and improve that a little further because I like it. Um, so w what would be my options? Take this as uh, how I see it right now. I believe that with the release of the next prototype, we will be able to have the packages mirrored to OBS. Thank you. Anyway, take it as my belief as I see the situation right now or earlier today. Other questions? So, um, with the partly container workloads and the part, uh, yeah, direct workloads on the bare metal, is there some special, um, some certain um, container engine plans to be used or is this uh, beyond uh, decided yet? Uh, the, pre the preferred uh, container engine uh, by uh, our products uh, is uh, Podman, and I assume it will not change before uh, the release of the products. However, it is not the only shipped container. We plan uh, to ship uh, Docker and container D as well, so that it's uh, the user's choice. And keep in mind, it's an adaptable Linux platform. If you come with a big check with 10 million written on it, we can consider every choice you want. If you have that check, it should be better covered. <laughs> Seriously, um, any specific engine you would like to see there? No, just asking out of curiosity. Maybe uh, it could have been that uh, as you yeah, want some quite uh, yeah, um, change um, integration into maybe starting a systemd service which then starts a container or something, you would say, oh, we are now developing some uh, adoption of some container engine or write our own stack on top of some basic engine. So just curiosity. I had recently a talk with one ISV who does exactly that. They have their software part as container, part as a systemd service that gets installed. And they said that the problem in more than 90% of all cases is not the container engine that is used, but other things that hit them and impact them. So. I think we have, with the current choice, a good choice that will work in most cases. But of course, there is always the option of choice. And I don't think we should limit that. And we should also make a difference here, maybe at one point in time, between an OpenSUSE ALP leap, or however it is called, based on the ALP side, compared to a commercial product. Have you considered uh, about uh, the usage of Quadlet, which enables the creation of a dot .container file sim uh, similar to a unit file, and then starts up a Podman container? I think it's some newish thing f from the Fedora corner. Um, along the same lines, is there any plan to allow the use of a tiny Kubernetes distribution or any Kubernetes distribution? Like K3S or RK2 or anything else you like? I mean. Short answer, yes. <laughs> so uh, I think that we, 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 we have been discussing this for some time and I was also like uh, advertised it publicly that um, Alp wants to be a platform where you can run containers either through the, you know, uh, local uh, container engines like Docker, Podman, 
uh, as much as supporting Kubernetes orchestration. Uh, as such, for example, one of the prototypes that we shipped, I think it was the December prototype, if, if memory doesn't play me, we uh, showcased K3S running on it. Right? And it was installable through the, the zipper command, and it was coming in and, and, and taking it from the standard K3S upstream repo and bootstrapped and, 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 and available there for, for, for container orchestration. Uh, with regards to RK2, we are in, you know, in conversations uh, with, the, with the other uh, organizational unit in, in SUSE. Uh, and, and the moment that they are ready, we will be ready to support it, obviously. Other questions? Could you clarify a bit about the container engine? So, w would you want to, or would you envision that a system would then be having both Podman and something like K3S and RKE2, or would you envision that then the containers that are initially configured to run with Podman would somehow be migrated over to Kubernetes? No, I, I think that basically is providing the, the fact that these tools, these infrastructures just work as well as everything else. So uh, Docker, Podman, Containerd, uh, any versions of Kubernetes, none of them should be necessarily the first class citizen and the other ones are just working. They would be there equally, treated equally, supported equally, and then it really depends on the use case that we are talking about, right? Because a lot of things uh, a lot, m many users may, may, for example, prefer Docker Compose, which can create some uh, level of orchestration for your containers versus installing a whole, uh, a full-fledged versions of Kubernetes, because they don't require such a complex scenario. The, the, the point that we are trying to make is the platform is as flexible as possible so that basically we are not mandating to the end user what to use, and the, the user has the choice to create more complex scenarios when needed through any Kubernetes distribution, or just use Docker, simple command line to run a local container. Because the use cases are very, very diverse. And it's not like we can recommend use K3S rather than using Docker, because they do different things and they fit different needs. Right, but it affects the user experience of what the user would actually do in order to get certain workloads on their system. Like, for example, we would, my understanding, um, have an RPM package on the host system that would be installing systemd unit files to run as a service, something that would then, I guess, have hard-coded that it would be running Podman and not, you know, Podman Docker somehow, you know, like with a big thing. Right? So at some point, there is going to be a choice made which runtime for a specific download would be applied. And if you, you know, wanted to pro provide the full choice and have the same equality across problems, then we would need to provide like a whole array of ways to install the application for, you know, on the host system. And you are totally right in what you're saying, but that's not a property of the platform. So what we are talking about here is ALP which is the platform, and we have been tried to stay away from the product definition because it's not yet def defined, right? And so you could basically come up with several different examples of different products, if you wish, to see different needs where, where now you have the choice necessarily provided by default because it's what we envision to be the right choice, but that's not a property of the platform. That would be something that leaves in the product. And since there isn't a product line defined yet, I cannot really tell you where you will find what. OK, so <clears throat> let one me add one comment on that also. When you say supported, you mean in most cases enabled. And that's a different 
that we should make because I know some of our competition use the word supported very generously, simply saying we provide it and call that supported. But for SUSE support, it means you can call us and we will drop everything and try to help you. Um, there's a difference between enabling several different engines. Will we do that? Yes, because we are open. We try not to vendor lock in anybody. Then there's, of course, the maintenance status of getting updates, security fixes from upstream and other parts. And they support it when you really want us to help you because your machine is currently down and you're losing money by the minute. And let's make there the difference. Yes, you will be enabling several engines. Will all of them be supported? Which means you pay us money so that we drop the pen and help you in a critical situation. I doubt it, because there's a huge amount of engine outs there. But it may depend on the product. Engine that is supported on one product may not be supported on another one. Correct. So with that, we're finished. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs>